light and joy in Jesus Christ our Lord. Praise be to God. The angel of the Lord declared unto Mary, and she conceived by the Holy Spirit, Behold the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. The word was made flesh. And dwelt among us. Let us pray together. Pour into our hearts the grace, O God, that we, to whom the incarnation of your Son has been made known by the message of an angel, may, by his cross and passion, be brought to the fullness of his resurrection. We pray through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. sun's light is swallowed up by the growing darkness of night, you renew your promise to reveal among us the splendor of your glory, made visible to us in Jesus Christ, your Son. of an oppressed and conquered land, among the poor in lowly circumstances, you entrusted your Son, the light of his Father's face, to reveal the glory of God that shines in humble faith. Strengthen us in our doubts, and give us the grace of Mary's faith to do your will, that with her we may ever sing your praises, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen.
A reading from the Gospel of Luke. In those days, a decree went out from Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration and was taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. All went down to their own towns to be registered. Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, the city of David, called Bethlehem, because he was descended from the house and family of David. He went to be registered with Mary, to whom he was engaged, and who was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child, and she gave birth to her firstborn son, and wrapped him in bands of cloth, and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. In that region, there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch of their flock by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Saviour, who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace among those whom he favours. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let us go now to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. So they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the child lying in the manger. When they saw this, they made known what had been told them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured all these words and pondered them in her heart. The word of the Lord. I speak to you in the name of Jesus Christ, the one who was and is and is to come. Amen. One of my favorite quotes from the author C.S. Lewis, the man responsible for the Narnia children's books, is a quote on humility. Lewis wrote, true humility isn't thinking less of yourself, it's thinking of yourself less. Of course, thinking of yourself isn't always a sign that you lack humility, especially if what you're thinking about is whether you have humility and what true humility is. And we're going to reflect on that tonight in the light of the Nativity story. As we treasure the words we've heard and as Mary did ponder them in our hearts. One aspect of the Nativity story that I think connects with humility is the unexpected nature of it. On one hand, the birth of Jesus fulfills all the prophecies concerning the coming of the Messiah. Isaiah's prophecy that a young woman, translated by Matthew as a virgin, would conceive and bear a son. The Psalms declaration that kings from the east would bring gifts. And of course, Micah's prophecy that the Messiah would be born in the birthplace of David, Bethlehem. And yet, despite all of that, none of it really happened in a way anyone expected. The Messiah, the Son of God, the Prince of Peace, was not born in a great palace or among the socially and politically powerful. Despite the prophecy of Micah, it must have been frightening if not downright exasperating to Joseph to have to travel all that way, not to mention exasperating for Mary in the last stages of her pregnancy. They must have been perplexed as they huddled in that stable, finding no place in the inn, given that they were God's chosen parents for this holy child. One might expect God to have made better arrangements for his special servants. And then there was the angel's own announcement to Mary that God would give her son the throne of his ancestor, David. 
What must Mary have thought? What must Joseph have thought, huddling in that stable, wondering where's the throne? Where's the glory? Was Mary comforting herself as she lay in the straw with the memory that David too had begun his life amongst the sheep? Whatever they felt, however frightened, confused, or exasperated, with everything the way that it was unfolding, Mary and Joseph maintained their faithful trust that God had a plan and that God was working that plan through even the difficult and unexpected circumstances of their lives. I think this is a big part of true humility, being able to be surprised without being stymied, being able to have things not go according to our plan because we know that our little plans are all part of a much bigger plan, God's, and that's the plan that matters. As St. Paul would later write to the Corinthians, we are hard pressed on every side, but we are not crushed because we know that God's will is still being done. And I think this is a sign of humility, the willingness to let go of having everything go our way because we trust God's way and that, is, and that God's way is unfolding amidst all the unexpected surprises and frustrations of our lives. Perhaps this is what Lewis meant when he talked about thinking less, not less of ourselves, but of ourselves less. Humility recognizes that it isn't just about us. Joseph would have been completely within his rights to bar any rough and tumble shepherd from barging into the, sh the, to, into the stable to see the newborn baby. It would have been perfectly reasonable for Mary, having just given birth, to insist on having one day to rest and get used to her baby before having to share him with others. But Mary knew from the beginning that her son was not given to her for herself and for Joseph alone. Perhaps she even saw in these shepherds a reminder of her son's destiny to become a good shepherd himself, who would gather sheep from many folds into one flock. Humility allows us to embrace not only unexpected circumstances, but unexpected and even sometimes unwanted people, because they too may well be part of God's unfolding plan. Humility recognizes that God's agenda always includes us, but it doesn't always include our agendas. In, in her words to Elizabeth, which we heard last week, known as the Magnificat, the Song of Mary, Mary proclaimed that her son was coming to overturn the ways of the world, that the humble poor would be raised up, and the wealthy and powerful would be cast from their thrones. Mary and Joseph and the shepherds were all confronted by a God who embraced the lowly and the humble by choosing to live among them, by choosing them to care for Jesus, by choosing them to reveal himself first. I've always marveled that both Mary and Joseph are willing to accept their own humble circumstances as perfectly acceptable for the Son of God. Had I been either one of them, I think I would have been constantly trying to prove myself, trying to impress God a little more. Maybe as Joseph, I might have wanted to build a bigger house, you know, something more suitable to shelter the Son of God. If I had been Mary, maybe I would have insisted that only the finest linens be used to swaddle the Son of God. Maybe I would have sent him off to be raised by Zechariah and Elizabeth so that he could be close to Jerusalem and be educated by all the most famous rabbis. But Mary and Joseph have the humility to know that what, what's good enough for God in choosing them is good enough for them. They know that it's not their external circumstances that make them worthy any more than it was the rough appearances of the shepherds that made them acceptable as Jesus's first visitors. It's the state of the heart, the inner goodness, kindness, faithfulness, 
that make us wonderful in God's eyes, however humble our circumstances. And perhaps that's the greatest act of humility, to accept that it is our own lowliness which God loves and embraces, that we ourselves have no glory to give to God, except a simple act of love. This is captured perfectly by another writer, Christina Rossetti, the poet, who said in her poem, later made into a famous Christmas carol, In the Bleak Midwinter, angels and archangels may have gathered there, cherubim and seraphim thronged the air, but his mother only, in her maiden bliss, worshipped the beloved with a kiss. Simple, humble, loving, and entirely what God wants. Amen.
God of glory, who chose Mary and Joseph of Nazareth to tend this newly kindled light of your Son. Help us to also receive and nurture this light, that we too may bear it into the dark places of our world. Let your light, Lord Jesus, shine in the darkness. Fill us with the hope, peace, and joy of Christ's coming, that we may be renewed in strength and rise above the divisions of this world to embrace your vision for peace. Let your light, Lord Jesus, shine in the darkness. Confront our perplexed and confused anxiety and ease our minds with the promise of your faithfulness. Strengthen us to carry out our service to others in righteousness and trust. Let your light, Lord Jesus, shine in the darkness. As those in Bethlehem, Mary, Joseph, and the shepherds, put aside their anxieties and trusted in you to guide them, to protect them, to provide for them, and to reveal your glory to them, so we ask for your help to also trust. Let your light, Lord Jesus, shine in the darkness. Dear friends, in the nativity of our Lord, the light of Christ began to shine among us. But it did so amidst poverty, fear, and oppression. I invite you, therefore, in the name of the Lord, to take a moment of silence and to accompany me to the altar in spirit, where I will light a candle for you, or if you can, you might light a candle yourself at home, and ask the Lord to help you confront the darkness within your own heart and within your own community with the brilliant and undiminished light of his presence, perhaps praying in your heart. Help us treasure these words and ponder them in our hearts. Come, O God of joy, and make within us your dwelling place and home. May our darkness be dispelled by your light, and our fears dispelled by your peace, revealed to us in the word made flesh. This we ask in the name of the light in our darkness, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Gathering all our cares into one, let us pray. Our, our Father, who art in heaven, heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.